The Hoover Institution is the nation's preeminent research center dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. Hoover research has directly led to policies that have produced greater opportunity and freedom in the United States and the world. How has Hoover achieved this distinction? By assembling an extraordinary fellowship of policy-oriented academics and scholarly practitioners, by offering open access to a world-renowned library and archives, and by resolutely focusing on ideas that define a free society. Herbert Hoover is the founder of the institution that bears his name. After graduating in Stanford's pioneer class in 1895, he became a successful mining engineer, renowned humanitarian, and president of the United States. While administering famine relief to Belgium during World War I and participating in the subsequent Paris Peace Conference, Hoover recognized the importance of collecting historical material that could yield knowledge about preventing a recurrence of the calamities he had witnessed in Europe. In April 1919, he pledged $50,000 to Stanford University to support his war collection. We celebrate this pivotal moment 100 years ago as the founding of what was to become the Hoover Institution. By 1929, Hoover's War Library contained 1.4 million items and had already become the largest in the world focused on the Great War and its aftermath. Collecting expanded to include material related to social, political, and economic change in the 20th century. Hoover Tower was completed in 1941 to house the rapidly growing library and archive. In 1957, the collection was definitively renamed the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Hoover's vision for the institution is captured in a statement to the Stanford Board of Trustees in 1959. The institution supports the Constitution of the United States, its Bill of Rights, and its method of representative government. The overall mission of this institution is, from its records, to recall the voice of experience against the making of war, and by the study of these records and their publication, to recall man's endeavors to make and preserve peace. The institution itself must constantly and dynamically point the road to peace, to personal freedom, and to the safeguards of the American system. By the 1970s, the institution was generating influential research on government regulation, tax policy, national security, health care, social security, energy, and proposals to limit government expenditures. Many innovative public policy proposals developed by Hoover Fellows were adopted in the 1980s, and Hoover contributed influential policy ideas for countering communism that ultimately led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991. The all-volunteer army, the flat tax, the Taylor rule for monetary policy, and school choice and accountability are all transformative policy ideas generated by Hoover Fellows. Hoover's timeless fundamental values of freedom, private enterprise, and limited effective representative government derive from 100 years of scholarship and the lessons of history. The Hoover Institution is poised for even greater impact in the years ahead, informing the marketplace of ideas, advising the country's policymakers, and illuminating the road to prosperity and peace in America and around the world. This lecture series brings together Hoover Fellows to discuss how the ideas and values that have undergirded the institution for 100 years remain crucial in understanding and formulating public policy in the 21st century. I'm delighted to be participating in this speaker series celebrating 100 years of the Hoover Institution. Uh, this institution has meant a lot to me going all the way back to my undergraduate days when I used to sit in the library researching my honors thesis about Soviet intervention in Eastern Europe. And tragically, that theme is still with us because Russia does intervene in Eastern Europe today. And so I think the question is why? Is it because of some kind of cultural or historical reason or the balance of power in the international system? Or is it because of the regime type? That is, do democracies behave differently than autocracies, or is it just about the balance of power in the international system? That's the question I hope we answer in our panel. In the aftermath of the Second World War, a world order emerged. It was 
was underpinned by the military and the economic strength of the United States. It was shaped by American ideals, and it was bolstered and supported by regional alliances that we enjoyed and by particular relationships that were important to that order. It was challenged, to be sure, most acutely in Europe by the Soviet Union, but with our NATO allies, uh, we withstood that challenge. We fought wars in the Middle East and wars in Asia. But that order is perhaps under more intense challenge today by Russia in Europe and in the Middle East, by Iran and Turkey as they assert themselves in the Middle East, and of course with the rise of China in Asia and beyond. I think the world is undergoing a change whose dimensions are only comparable to what happened in Renaissance. The very idea of knowledge, how knowledge is disseminated, who has access to knowledge, the rise of secularism, the rise of the scientific revolution, the printing press, changed the world beyond anyone's imagination. We live in a similar moment. And the Middle East is, in a sense, the cauldron of all of these changes. Every aspect of what I told you about, the changes that are being brought about are happening in the Middle East. Migration patterns are changing. There are millions of Muslims living in the West. There is a new form of Islamic radicalism that is rising, that is very good in using internet, uh, and how that will impact both the region in terms of their ability to fight asymmetric wars and their ability to influence the Muslims in the Middle East, the Muslims in the West, and how that influence will uh, impact liberal democracy is, I think, one of the most serious, profound moments, almost epochal in our history. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Gilligan. I'm the director of the Hoover Institution. I want to welcome you to this seventh session in our centennial speaker series titled A Century of Ideas for a Free Society. This, is, this series features 11 panel discussions over the course of the year to showcase the rigorous scholarship and research central to the institution's mission and values. Today's discussion is titled New Regional Orders and New Ways of War, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, and includes a distinguished panel of participants. First is Michael McFall. Michael McFall is the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, as well as a professor of political science at Stanford University. He is also the director and a senior fellow of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. From January 2012 to February 2014, he served as the US ambassador to the Russian Federation. Before becoming ambassador, he served for three years as a special assistant to the president and senior director for Russian and Eurasian affairs at the National Security Council. His most recent book was a New York Times bestseller published in 2018 titled From Cold War to Hot Peace, an American Ambassador in Putin's Russia. Our second panelist is Abbas Milani. Abbas Milani is a research fellow and co-director of the Iran Democracy Project at the Hoover Institution. In addition, Milani is the Hamad and Christine Mahaganam, director of Iranian studies at Stanford University. His expertise is U.S.-Iran relations and Iranian culture, political, and security issues. His most recent book is titled, A Window into Modern Iran, the Ardashir Zahidi Papers at the Hoover Institution Library and Archives, which will be released next week. Our final panelist is Admiral Gary Ruffhead. Admiral Ruffhead is the Robert and Marion Oster Distinguished Military Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Admiral Ruffhead graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1973. In September of 2007, he became the 29th Chief of Naval Operations after holding six operational commands. He is one of only two officers in the United States Navy's history to have commanded both the Atlantic and Pacific fleets. And today's moderator is Admiral Cecil Haney. Admiral Haney completed 38 years of distinguished service in the United States Navy before retiring in 2017. A career submariner, he headed the U.S. Strategic Command, which is responsible for strategic capabilities involving nuclear weapons, missile defense, space, and cyberspace. 
He also commanded the U.S. fleet responsible for operations in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Please join me in welcoming this esteemed group to the stage. Good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here at the Hoover Institute and to be part of the celebration of 100 years of just distinguished, remarkable contributions in the world of, of policy, not just for the United States, but I would say for the world in general. Uh, and what a marvelous campus, so I'm always happy when I get invited here and share the stage with these heavyweights, brainiacs, when it comes to the subject we're going to talk about today. As we look at the world today, it may be at a pivotal point as we think about uh, what's going on in so many different areas. And we look at where we were 100 years ago, what we learned, particularly as we went World War I, World War II, Depression, Cold War, and then to think about what challenges that face us uh, here today. So as we dig into these countries, Russia, China, Iran, and we look at what is the disruptive behavior that they are producing that will be impacting the, the global norms that were established some time ago, some seven decades ago. Uh, so as we go through this, uh, hopefully we will also be priming the pump for your questions uh, as we have the conversation up here uh, that will follow and uh, I hope we're going to get the extreme from the youngest to the oldest in this uh, auditorium in providing us uh, thoughtful questions. So I'd like to do this so that we start off sort of setting the stage, setting uh, what the world looks like in these, two, these three regions. Uh, and what are they doing today that we see that's so disruptive uh, in this uh, world order? So I'm going to start first with uh, Iran. And Abbas, would you lead us off? Well, I think the whole Middle East, including Iran, is undergoing a profound moment of transition. Uh, if you look at the Middle East, go from Morocco to Afghanistan, the number of failed states or failing states, the number of actors who do not believe in the international order and want to disrupt it, who do not believe in democracy and want to disrupt it, uh, the population patterns, the youth bulb, the remarkable disparity between the very rich and the very, very poor, uh, the increasing number of authoritarian regimes there that have turned the promise of the Arab Spring and the Iranian Democratic Revolution into brutal uh, authoritarian regimes, all uh, provide, I think, a bleak uh, picture. And the number of uh, radical Islamic groups supported by uh, Iran or Saudi Arabia, the number of radical ideas that are propagated by these two countries uh, with the expenditure of great uh, fortunes uh, is a very, very tense moment, I think. Uh, and the fact that oil is on the decline and that the, these countries, the ones that are not abjectly poor, have to look for alternative sources of uh, wealth. Uh, puts them in a very, very challenging moment. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Michael, given your close relationship with uh, Russia and Mr. Putin, perhaps. A close relationship with Putin? <laughs> <laughs> We're not exactly Facebook friends. Um, <laughs> although, given what goes on on Facebook, maybe we are, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say, I, I said a little bit of in the video, but I really want to underscore what an honor it is for me to be here celebrating Hoover at 100 years. Uh, as a young kid from Montana, uh, I, sp I stumbled into the archives uh, when I was 18 years old. Uh, it helped to spark an interest in history. I later wrote my honors thesis about Soviet interventions in Hungary, 1956, Czechoslovakia, 1968, and why they did not intervene, Timothy Gartnash, because uh, I was reading you back then uh, in Poland. And, and I just want to say it is really important for, for people to study history 
And the only way you can study history is to have places like the Hoover Institution that gathers that information. And uh, I have been a, a beneficiary of it for four decades now, and I just uh, I wanna say thank you, Hoover, and what a privilege it is to, to celebrate this place. I also happen to believe in ideas of a free society, uh, so that makes it easy for me to also be here, and I, I'm, I'm also, I think this moment in our history, especially talking about China, Iran, and Russia, presents new challenges to those ideas of, of a free society, and I think this is a great panel to, to discuss that. Uh, baseline, that's what you wanted first, right? So where are we at in terms of Russia and relation with the West? I deliberately uh, called my last book, available on Amazon for you right now, uh, uh, From Cold War to Hot Peace, because I wanted to echo the Cold War, but I don't think we're actually in a new Cold War with Russia. And so that was the purpose of that title. And, and let me just give you a few kind of data points about why I think that's where we're at today. And then I think we need to explain why, and then maybe later in the conversation we'll talk about what is to be done. Uh, so good news, bad news. The good news is that we are not in a quantitative nuclear arms race with Russia today. We're going in the right direction. We're going down. We should go down further. I see Secretary Schultz is here, and I know he agrees with me. Uh, 1,550 nuclear weapons on each side is still enough to blow up the planet. We should get that number lower. But it's nowhere near where it was uh, when both of these gentlemen were fighting the Soviets and planning, trying to prevent fights with the Soviets, when we were at 30, 40, 50,000 uh, nuclear weapons. That's the good news. The bad news from the, uh, the, the hot peace that we're in today is we are now entering, I think, a qualitative arms race that is scary to me. And I hope Admiral Haney will jump in on this later in the conversation because the Russians have some new platforms to launch missiles in qualitatively different ways than they did during the Cold War. One of them is called the Poseidon. Uh, it's a, it, again, I, I feel a little bit awkward with two admirals surrounding me talking about the Poseidon. Uh, they know a lot more about this weapon than I do, but uh, it's a weapon that can go through the, the ocean, uh, explode a nuclear weapon, and then flood people that live near bays. Flood us. Guess where we live? Uh, that's new. That's different. We didn't have a weapon like that in the Cold War. So better or worse off? You tell me. Second, good news. The ideological struggle between communism and capitalism or communism and democracy is over. They may be still arguing up there at Berkeley, I think, you know, but I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's over. It's over. That's the good news. We won that ideological struggle. The bad news is that there is a new ideological struggle. Most of you probably are not really focused on it, but Vladimir Putin, my Facebook friend, uh, thinks that he's fighting an ideological struggle against the West, against liberalism, against the very ideas that this institution stands for. For many years, he was playing defense, and now he's gone on the offense to, to promote his brand of nativism, nationalism, anti-multilateralism, so the very things you were talking about in your interview, Admiral, are the very things he hates. And he wants to break up the West. He wants to break up NATO, the European Union. And, and he is now adding real resources to fight that ideological struggle. And I think we're behind on that. So good news or bad news, you tell me. Third one, third, and I'll stop on this in terms of where we're at. Uh, the good news is that we are not fighting proxy wars all over the planet against the Soviet Union. The Cold War actually was not a Cold War. It was a hot war. Millions of people died, including lots of Americans. Thankfully, uh, we are not doing that. The bad news of our current moment is there are certain things going on that we didn't do during the Cold War in terms of our struggle with, with the Soviet Union. Annexation. We thought that was over after World War II. We fought a war in part to stop annexation in Europe. Now it's back when Putin went in and annexed uh, Crimea. That's disturbing. That's something we didn't see in the Cold War. Sanctions. We today, the United States of America, have more people from Russia on our sanctions list than at any time, if you added up every Soviet during the entire Cold War, we have more today than we did in the entire Cold War history. And by the way, the Russians have more Americans on their sanctions list than at any time during the Cold War. I know. I'm on that list. I can't travel to Russia today. That's new. That's different. And the last piece, better or worse off, you tell me, is yes, there was disinformation campaigns during the Cold War on both sides. Uh, we would call ours information campaigns, of course. Uh, 
But never did we have the level of intervention in our domestic affairs as we did in 2016 by Moscow. That's new. So these are new, these are new ways that we're fighting this hot peace. You tell me if we're better or worse off in terms of the, of the Cold War. Uh, and maybe I'll leave for explanation for the next round. But that, I think, is where we're at. And I think it's deeply troubling. And I think we're going to be here for a long, long time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Cecil. And um, thank you all for being here. And I never miss the opportunity to thank the Hoover Institution for the opportunities that it affords folks like us and, and so many others to think about things and provide thoughts and ideas that maybe, just maybe, can help us chart a better course for the future for your children and, and your grandchildren. And I never miss the opportunity to thank Bob and Mary and Oster for their generosity in making it possible for me to continue to be part of the Hoover Institution. Um, we have three regions that we're talking about. And when I think about Asia, I think about it in three things. You know, the Chinese like numbers and series of numbers. So we have the two threes, the three regions, and then my three as I look at Asia. When I came into the Navy, we talked about the Western Pacific. Then we talked about the Asia Pacific. Now we're talking about the Indo-Pacific. And I would submit that what we really need to think about is Eurasia and how it's changing. And what are the three things that I think come into play? I refer to it as the empires of the past are stirring again. We have China. We have the Persian Empire. We have the Russian Empire. And as you move farther to the west, the Ottoman Empire, all beginning to move and to assert themselves in what a great strategist called the world's island, Eurasia, the, the large landmass. So how do, how do we see that happening? What are they doing and, and what are the dynamics that it's putting in place? The second thing that I think we have to be mindful of and acknowledge up front is that the United States has become a bit weary. Uh, we are wrapping up almost two decades of conflict. I would argue that many people in the country have been very detached from it, and they're wondering, what was it all about? What was Iraq about? What was Afghanistan about? And, and I think that we are beginning to retreat into what for most of our nation's history has been a period of isolation, and that the, the great oceans of the world will buffer us against bad things. And then the third thing that's in play in Eurasia is, as, as Mike and others have talked about, it's technology. Uh, technology has always influenced events. It has always influenced warfare. But the pace with which it's happening today is really quite dizzying. And, you know, Cecil and I have spent our lives playing with technology, but I would tell you I've not seen it move this fast. And central to all of this is the emergence of China that sees itself coming on and reasserting itself and reestablishing itself in its rightful place in Eurasia. And uh, China is quite strategic. Uh, they have a much longer view than we do. Their strategy that they've put together uh, is one that involves economics, it involves the security or the military, um, and it involves technology. And they are linked together. But something different about China this time, I think, as it reasserts itself, is for the first time in a long time, it is a maritime power. Now, we can look at our Navy and we can say that we are the, the world's premier global Navy. And that is absolutely true. No one can hold a candle to it. But China has become a maritime power. Uh, it has the world's largest fishing fleet. It has the world's largest commercial fleet. Uh, it is it just surpassed uh, Korea as the largest builder of commercial uh, vessels. And it has displaced uh, Europe as the main source of financing uh, for ships around the world. Through its Belt and Road, it has put in a series of ports uh, since uh, the, the, about 2000. Uh, it either built or controls 42 ports in 34 nations. Uh, that means that it has a logistics footprint that's global. 
It has uh, an opportunity through that footprint, perhaps to make things a little more challenging for us as we try to respond and support allies and partners in various places around the world. Um, it also um, has created, and, and you've looked at the East China Sea, the South China Sea, it has, as it's moved forward in that regard, it's created an inland sea that has put a buffer around the East Asian littoral. And one would argue that if Taiwan is the final place, uh, piece to be put in place, that inland sea is now complete. Um, and it's doing it largely because when it goes back to the beginning of its uh, century of humiliation, that's where um, the humiliation began. It came from the sea. On technology, the investments that they're making are quite significant. Artificial intelligence, about $150 billion by 2030. Uh, cyber cities that are, uh, they're investing about $15 billion. But most importantly, they have made it a concerted effort to invest in human capital. Uh, when you look at the number of computer scientists, electrical engineers, China has now surpassed the United States in, in uh, high level degrees in that. And so I think that the, the, the combination of, a, of an economic strategy, building a military that is the largest in Asia today, in, in Eurasia today, and then investing very deeply in technology, and we'll talk about that later, has really knitted it together in a very, very complete way. China's not without headwinds. You read about it in the paper all the time. Their economy is slowing. They have a middle income trap. Um, um, their demographics are going to turn markedly around 2030. But the question is, where will they be in 2030? And who will control Eurasia, I think, is the great question for us to answer. And I think another backdrop, you talked a lot about technology here, is as we look at these uh, three areas, three regions, each has a different approach toward technology. Each has a different appetite for technology. And if you will, um, um, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, but for China, it's from under the sea all the way to geosynchronous orbit in a very sophisticated way. Uh, very interesting in, in how they have really moved forward in a lot of areas. Uh, we'll start perhaps back with you. For a while there, the U.S. strategy was associated with moving forward with a third offset. We were talking about it boldly. Are we uh, trending in the right direction relative to China with the third offset, or is China ahead in, in some of those um, areas. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you said that for a while we were talking a lot about the third offset. Mm -hmm. Talking is the operative word, I might add. Um, and, and, and how are you moving those technologies forward? Do you have the intellectual capital? And particularly when you get into the uh, national security space, uh, you know, Stanford and Georgia Tech and, and, and many other institutions can say we produce the best computer scientists in the world, and that is a fact. But once you start getting into national security, one has to ask the question, how many of those individuals can be brought into the national security establishment, get a security clearance, which means they're United States citizens? And when you look at the numbers, it's absolutely stunningly bad. 21% um, of computer science graduates uh, a couple of years ago were U.S. citizens. Electrical engineers, 19% U.S. citizens. And I would argue that we have a lot more young people going into those disciplines. However, our elementary and secondary schools are not providing the foundations upon which they can build to succeed and graduate uh, in, in those disciplines. So, I think that we have to get very, very serious about where the investment's going um, and not simply talk about the fact that we have this third offset strategy uh, for those who may be linked to it in some way. I've often said that uh, there's a lot of sizzle and no steak. Thank you. Um, Michael, perhaps you can talk a little bit about how you see Russia using or 
having a trend to invest in technology in order to carry out uh, their uh, activities that impact this global order? Uh, sure, actually, I highly recommend a paper and book that George Schultz edited when we talked about all this about Russia about a year ago, I think now, George, where we wrestled with technology and demography. I mean, both those issues that you talked about in talking about Russia and Europe. Um, the, the short answer is they have wasted a lot of their uh, capacity in terms of human capital. Uh, they do produce a lot of mathematicians, a lot of PhDs in physics. And at a certain point, maybe 20 years ago, but especially 15 years ago, and under President Medvedev, uh, who was an interim president between Putin's second and third term, a uh, younger guy than, um, uh, in fact, he spoke here at Stanford, now that I remember, in 2010, uh, they recognized what you were just talking about, and they uh, made a pivot to try to uh, move government money in, and research and development into technological fields. Uh, they, they started something called Skolkova. Uh, they tried to model it after the Silicon Valley. Uh, and everybody in the Silicon Valley, by the way, laughed at them. They said, oh, you can't, government has nothing to do with the Silicon Valley. You're going to waste all this money. It's just entrepreneurs that matter, right? Uh, and well, it turns out the history of the Silicon Valley is a little more complicated than that. And that uh, government money played an instrumental role in, in uh, creating the permissive conditions to develop what we have here, including, by the way, Stanford University. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty smart idea. Uh, and Medvedev decided that we eventually will lose the 21st century if all we can do is pump oil and gas out of the ground and take eggs out of fish. Uh, he joked about that once, I believe. Uh, you know, we got to make something uh, in, in, in the digital world. And I would say when uh, President Putin came back, uh, he did two things. One, he diverted the best and the brightest and the research into military fields that, that you, you gentlemen know uh, better than I do, uh, and that has had that has achieved some things. I mean, I think they have made some real uh, technological advances uh, in the military. Uh, the fact that our ally, the Turkish uh, Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, is buying the S-400 uh, weapon and not uh, our systems, that's a bad, that's a really bad sign to me. Uh, and these other platforms that I talked about, delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons, is also a bad sign. And let's just be clear. Uh, about this, this, this hunger to go back to the good old days of the 19th century when these two oceans protected us. That are, those oceans don't protect us against cyber weapons and, and uh, nuclear weapons. Let's, that is a myth. We can be nostalgic if we want, but there's no going backwards. Uh, so he's diverted there in ways that, that have, have advanced their, not just their, uh, their nuclear, by the way, their, their conventional capabilities, their cyber capabilities, their capabilities in space. Admiral Haney, maybe you should comment on all this as well. Uh, I want to make sure we pull you into this conversation. But at the expense, I would say, of this civilian side, and I think that is a, was a huge mistake. Um, uh, by the way, it's estimated that we have somewhere between uh, 50 and 60,000 Russians in the valley uh, who have come here uh, precisely because there were not the opportunities to realize their potential there. Uh, that's great for America. Uh, but that's pretty bad for Russia. And with it, uh, you might comment a bit on uh, Russia utilization of things like cyber in the information campaign at Spectrum. Uh, everything is not so hard military. That's right. I, I'm glad you pointed that out because uh, they do have uh, excellent cyber security capabilities. Uh, second only to the United States and maybe China. The last time I read secret information was a while ago, uh, uh, five years ago to be precise. But uh, they have tremendous capabilities. And by the way, people like me have to worry about those capabilities still to this day. I am a target for their activities in that, that domain. But the, the, the information part is also important. Uh, about a decade ago, like I said, Putin got tired of being on the defensive, right? He got tired of, of information from the West coming into his country, so he started to control it and shut it down, independent media. Uh, but then he started to export it. He, he invested in platforms to export their ideas. Things like Russia Today, things like Sputnik, things like the Internet Research Agency that we learned about in 2016. Uh, where, and, and those investments, mo at the time, 
you know, a lot of people, including myself, I want to be uh, honest here, we kind of laughed at it. You know, you look at Russia today, it doesn't seem serious. Who, who could honestly be watching this? And you all have Russia. If you have cable TV, you all have it. Go check it out tonight. Go find it. It's on the 200s or so, I think, uh, in the system. And you'll look at it and you say, man, this seems really silly. Uh, but then look at the numbers of RT on YouTube. They're the most watched news organizations on YouTube today. Uh, so somebody's watching. Uh, and those investments, I think, ha have produced results. Uh, and I think we have not paid enough attention, first, to the diagnoses of how does this work? How is it that they, they use these things? There's been more attention after 2016, but I think it's, it's grossly inadequate compared, including here at the Hoover, Hoover Institution, the amount of academic research we used to uh, devote to propaganda during the Cold War, we, we got out of the habit of it, right? Because we thought we'd won. The Cold War is over. Our ideas had won. We got, we got, we got soft. Uh, and I think we need to do some real research on those diagnostics to then figure out our new strategy in the 21st century. Because going back to RFE, RL, you know, Radio Liberty, uh, that's not going to be sufficient. And I, I think we're, I don't know about with, with respect to China and Iran, but with respect to Russia, I think we're losing ground. I really think we're losing ground. We're not paying attention. And um, uh, we need to, to, to develop much more attention to how they, they are working in this space. Gary, you want to come on? And I'd love to hear a boss talk about how information penetrates into, uh, into Iran. But uh, you know, how we think about how people pull information, uh, I think, is hugely important. There's a, a very good paper that was done at Purdue University uh, a couple of years ago. Um, similar to Stanford, has a very large Chinese student population. And, um, and one you know, would think, particularly those of, of my vintage, how are they getting their news? 80% of the Chinese students at Purdue University get their news from a Chinese language uh, social media site. So all of the newspapers and televisions that are booming around in our communities, that's not how people are absorbing news. So China is able to uh, provide information to its diaspora in, in a way that uh, potentially influences. And when you look at attitudes toward China and Russia among that Chinese student population at Purdue University, um, where they've come and assimilated into our communities for a period of years, uh, the numbers are not what you think they are. Opinions of China have gone up and opinions of the United States have gone down. And so how we think about how information moves, how information will play in warfare, to Mike's point, um, the, the ability now to reach in non-kinetically uh, into other countries and manipulate information to affect infrastructure, to uh, disrupt the daily lives of people, I think need to be looked at in ways that then overlay on other military capabilities that we have. And you know, we keep citing George Schultz here, but uh, George put together a, a series of discussions, and I had the privilege of uh, writing a paper with some of my colleagues from Johns Hopkins where we came up with a hypothetical scenario re involving Taiwan. We stopped it before any uh, shots were fired. But the technologies that we described in there just indicate how we have to think differently about these new ways of war. Thank you. Um, Abbas, uh, perhaps you can shed some light uh, on Iran uh, and, and technology, both in soft power and, and uh, other hardware from I think Iran brings uh, together many of the, the themes that was being discussed. <clears throat> in terms of uh, China and Russia and their influence in the Persian Gulf, I think China and Russia are now in a position they have never been before. Iran is about to have a joint naval operation with China and Russia. Iran is renting a naval base in Boucher, where Iran's nuclear uh, program is based, to Russia. Iran has just signed a long-term uh, mutual defense agreement with Russia, only a small parts of which have been made public. 
um, Iran has agreed to uh, a $400 billion ostensibly investment of China in Iran. Uh, it's not clear how much of that will be actually realized, but the fact that China will move in that direction, I think, is very important. Uh, Russia has never had as much influence in Iran as it does today. It's influence ideological, it's influence political, it's influence uh, military, it's alliance with, Russia, with uh, Iran in, uh, in the Middle East, it's alliance with Iran and uh, Syria, uh, have been absolutely unprecedented. And I think if this continues, if uh, we are in a Cold War with Russia, if the world is on a collision course of some sorts with China, how China and Russia position themselves in the Persian Gulf, how they position themselves Iran, in Iran is going to be of a very important, profound impact. And very few people are paying enough attention to this. I think there is a brotherhood of authoritarianism, and they are all brothers. There are not too many sisters in these authoritarian regimes. Uh, there is a brotherhood of authoritarianism. Uh, Mike has been talking about this. Uh, Larry Diamond has been talking about this, this depression of democracy, this deficit of democracy. The Iranian regime is clearly trying to align itself with this authoritarian uh, brotherhood. And in terms of technology, Iran is a very paradoxical country. In a sense that Iran, although it is 85 million, is the top 10 countries, one of the top 10 countries, seventh or eighth, in terms of the total number of people who are studying uh, science, uh, math, technology. Iran's university, at least a couple of them, are very well respected around the world. They're recruited. Sharif University is recruited at Stanford, at, at MIT. Iran is one of the most sophisticated hackers. Iran is one of the most controlled social media, but it's also one of the most active social media. In China, 7% of the Chinese use the convention tools to get news from sources outside China. In Iran, it is close to 80%. Uh, Facebook is illegal in Iran. There are 50 million users, and every Iranian leader also has a Facebook site. Uh, and but, Twitter account. And Twitter account. Yes. <laughs> it, it is truly, uh, but the regime uh, completely understands the capabilities of this social media and social control. And they do it not just for espionage purposes, and they're very good at that. They're constantly trying to hack Stanford's Iranian studies. They're, try, they're threatening directly all the people who are against the regime, uh, and they sometimes do succeed. But they employ Openly, they don't hide it. They employ at least 12,000 cyber jihadists. These are people whose sole purpose is to engage in social media, to attack the critics of the regime, to propagate its ideology. The regime uses very sophisticated technology, uh, very uh, most recent uh, technological abilities to monitor the, social, the, the people. They bought several years ago $600 million of technology from Siemens Nokia that allows them to pinpoint every telephone, every conversation, and listen. So while the society is uh, very engaged, uh, the regime, essentially because of its ideological intransigence, because of its sclerosis, has become uh, inhospitable for people who understand technology. Iran has the biggest uh, brain drain. Iran has been the number one brain drain country in the last four or five years. So in technology, I think it's very paradoxical. People are trying to use it. Iranian women are trying to use it. Social media is trying to use it to promote democratic values, to promote entrepreneurship. The regime is trying to use it for social control, for monitoring, for espionage and for what they call cyber jihad. Could I just add one thing about Russia, because it might be interesting to think about in comparative perspective, in terms of their strategy with respect to information and technology. It is not like it was during the Cold War, when Pravda and their, their various platforms would propagate, that was the verb you used, an alternative to our system, right? And they would try to win that argument. 
uh, sometimes within our society, but most times in other countries. It, when it, and it was an ideological struggle between the, what they were propagating and, and our system. That's not the strategy for Putin these days, the Russian strategy. They're not trying to win the argument. They're trying to say there are no arguments, there are no facts. That's what their disinformation campaign is about. Uh, it's all whataboutism. It's all, there, there's no facts. And if there's no facts, then, then everybody's as guilty as the other person. So that's one piece of it. And the second is polarization. Uh, they are trying to exacerbate existing uh, uh, polarization in societies, including our own. So, so they're not, they didn't start polarization, right? They, 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 they're working with something that are inside societies, but they are using the cleavages, the divides, the arguments that we already have in, in Western democracies. And by the way, we're open democracies, so we allow them to, to uh, participate in these debates, and they try to exacerbate uh, those things that are going on already in societies as a way to weaken us both uh, you know, as a nation state, but also vis-a-vis -vis our uh, democratic alliances in Europe. So remember, that I think is a qualitatively different kind of ideological struggle that we're in, and, and that's why I just underscore we need to understand it better uh, so that we develop the right prescriptions to combat it, because I do think it is a, it's going to be a fight, uh, you know, Iran, China, and Russia are all rising, you know, former empire civilizations that are all in one way or another uh, attacking the ideas that define a free society. We've got to get smarter about how we push back. I think the other thing to consider too, and I don't subscribe to the fact that there's a Russia uh, China alliance. I don't know where you are on that, Mike, but clearly they will look for opportunities um, to uh, be in a more dominant position than perhaps we would be, especially in, in, in Eurasia. Um, and I think that this has translated into a kind of a common view where you fuse uh, civil and military technology together in China. It's, it's an advocated right from President Xi on down that there will be civil military fusion when it comes to technology. But uh, China and Russia have now begun to draw closer together. My, my view in dealing with the Russian military a few years ago was that, that they were very distrustful of China. That said, um, you know, they've just announced a, uh, a, a desire to go to, back to the moon together. Uh, and so I think you're going to begin to see the, the interplay of technology that Russia may be more dominant in and that China is more dominant in bringing that together and making that an option for other countries to use. Because when I look at the Belt and Road, I always caution people to not just look at the brick and mortar and the piers and the bad loans that everybody keeps talking about, but look at how technology will be imported into those areas where uh, the, the Belt and Road centers and activities have become concentrated, and then that then becomes a source where China's um, uh, uh, telecommunications systems, social media systems, e-commerce systems can take root and thrive, and in doing so, win the economic uh, war in these important regions around the world. And I think these gentlemen would agree with me, uh, associated with the advances in artificial intelligence, 5G, uh, even in two of the countries, uh, hypersonic uh, missiles, et cetera, and that list of technology uh, developments and work, outer space, uh, uh, each of these countries have moved dramatically, Iran missile developments and what have you. Uh, before we leave the setting here, Michael talked a lot about Russia and their nuclear capabilities, some of the new novel approaches, the Poseidon piece. Recently we heard about a, uh, a cruise missile approach that sort of flamed out or at least uh, had an explosion associated with it. Uh, but before we leave, I'd like to hear more. What would a nuclear Iran mean to uh, this world order? Uh, and also, Gary, perhaps you can talk a little bit about uh, China is also a country that has uh, significant nuclear weapons capability. 
Well, first of all, I think if Iran uh, does uh, get its hands on a nuclear bomb, uh, you are going to actually be looking at the end of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, because Turkey, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt have all announced that if Iran gets its hands on one of these, they're going to try to get it. So you're going to have, in my view, a very serious armed race in the region. And it, uh, there are two theories about what Iran would do with the bomb. Uh, the Israeli government is very worried that if the Iranians get, uh, get their hands on a bomb, they might throw one on the wood towards Israel because destruction of Israel has been in the stated purpose of this regime repeatedly. My sense is that this is not a suicidal regime. They know that uh, Israel has a very serious military capability. Israel has 200 nuclear bombs. Israel has submarines that are nuclear armed right outside Iran. So uh, lobbing one in that direction would be profoundly suicidal for this regime. But if they do have the bomb, I think they will become even more reckless in terms of their regional behavior. If they think they have impunity, if they, if they think that they have a, a kind of a, a veto that they think North Korea has gotten, North Korea is teaching them a lot of bad lessons. You can read this in their uh, Iranian sites, that the reason the Trump administration walks so gingerly uh, with North Korea and does not deal in the same way with Iran is because North Korea has the bomb. And they openly say that we made, that the regime made a tactical error in not going for the bomb earlier and then engaging in these negotiations. So my sense is that if they do get it, you'll have an even more perilous regi uh, region uh, and you will have a regime that feels much more emboldened. They already feel a great deal uh, empowered. The attack on Saudi uh, oil facilities that I cannot imagine could have been done without the absolute approval of the Iranian regime. They might not have thrown it from Iran, but the Houthis didn't do it without the approval of the Iranian regime is a very flagrant act and takes the uh, level of in-your-facedness uh, in a new level. Thanks. Okay. Um, you know, sadly, I think um, nuclear weapons are still with us and uh, will be for some time. Um, also, sadly, we don't talk enough about the destructive effect of, of these incredible uh, weapons. I think we've become more focused on um, you know, cyber attacks and what have you. I often said in my waning days when I was on active duty, if I walked out of, the, of my office in the Pentagon and said to someone, you know, at random, let's talk about weapons of mass destruction, they'd go, oh, I'm all ready to talk about cyber. Um, they're not the same. Nuclear weapons are, are in a class unto themselves. Um, China has essentially followed our template and the Russian uh, template as well. It has developed a triad different than what it was like in the Cold War. Um, my sense is that China will not be pursuing large numbers of weapons. Uh, I think their view is if I can take out LA, you know, what's the trade off? Uh, and not go for the large numbers, but smaller. But they will have a capable nuclear arsenal. And with the advent, most recently, of a sea based nuclear deterrent, uh, they'll have a survivable leg that provides a second strike capability. And with that uh, sort of last question in the nuclear arena, uh, Michael, it seems like we're in a uh, trajectory where we're losing ground on treaties in that regard. Uh, had a good conversation yesterday with George Schultz uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, would you give your uh, views of where we are, where we seem to be going, and is that also going to be impacting this world order going forward? Well, I think the trajectory's in the, uh, in the wrong direction, without question. Uh, we learned during the Cold War that we could have fundamental disagreements with the Soviets and ideological disagreements uh, and still do arms control. 
And by the way, not check our values at the door when we engage with them. I think there's this misunderstanding of, of what happened during the Cold War. Uh, just because you sign a, an agreement doesn't mean you sign up to, uh, you know, some, that you're going to be Facebook friends, not to go back to Facebook friends. Uh, despite all of my radical disagreements with President Putin and his autocratic regime, and I want to come back to society, by the way. I don't, we're, we've been talking about Russia, China, and Iran like they're three people you might meet in a bar. Uh, there's very complex societies be, below these regimes, and, and I think they give me hope for the long term. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But, but uh, we developed that communication. We signed arms control agreements. Uh, by the way, we learned things from those agreements that were good for stability. Uh, you know, the verification uh, uh, regimes that, that came with those treaties were very important for just everybody knowing what the other side was doing. So um, uh, President Reagan used to say, trust but verify, right? That was his phrase. When I was in the U.S. government, I said, don't trust, only verify. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and if we do not have the treaties in place to do that, we will not have the capability to do that. So I think it was a huge mistake to pull out of the INF Treaty. Uh, with all due respect to the arguments about how we needed this in order to fight China, I'm not convinced. Uh, I think that was a huge mistake. Uh, and we need to avoid an even bigger mistake by allowing the new START Treaty to lapse. I think that just, there's just no sense to that. As I said before, we can blow up the planet with 1,500 nuclear weapons. And by the way, Russia can still blow us up with 1,500 nuclear weapons that they have, 1,550 to be exact, if you're counting. Uh, um, deterrence works. We need to keep that in place. But we do not want to be in a regime and in a world where we do not have treaties, where we do not have verification regimes. I think that, that is a very dangerous world, adding to what Abbas said about the NPT. Uh, that is not a world that I want to live in. Let's preserve what we learned during the Cold War to help us manage this next phase. I'd like to shift our rudder a little bit here and now dig a bit into, so what should we do about it? The, uh, you described a very uh, complex, complicated, uh, dangerous uh, trends that are ongoing uh, and a threat to our global order, seven decades of it. What, in your opinions, uh, should we be doing or leading the international community to be doing uh, associated with these trends? Start, please. Well, I think in terms of the Middle East, uh, the United States needs to develop a uh, cogent strategy. They need to go beyond uh, the mode of reaction. Um, I, I think uh, the United States doesn't really now have a strategy on where Iran should be. Uh, Iran's problem isn't only the nuclear issue. Iran will not become a lawful, uh, reasonable, rational part of the international community unless Iran becomes more democratic. And this is where the good news comes from. Iran has one of the most vibrant civil societies. Iran, in spite of the regime, in spite of its misogyny, has one of the most vibrant women's movement. I think American policy has to, while confronting the regime's egregious behaviors regionally, be uh, geared towards helping the Iranian people rid themselves of this regime. And you cannot help Iranian people rid them of this regime unless you also make it very clear to the international community, to Iran, that it is the job of the Iranian people to change it. The United States cannot change it. The United States should not change it. The United States tried to help change a regime in Iran in 1953. This role is highly exaggerated. Its stigma is still there. So the United States has to be very clear. We are on the side of the Iranian people. We are going to stand up to this regime's egregious behavior regionally. We are going to do everything in our power to help the people get to where they want and create a democratic Iran. A democratic Iran will have a lot of consequences for the region. An authoritarian, despotic Iran has now created 160,000 trained Shiite uh, 
radicals. That's the number of people that it is estimated the regime's proxies have. The Saudis, in order to counter Iran's radicalism, have helped create Taliban, have helped armed ISIS, have helped fund uh, Al-Qaeda. That has created a cauldron. The United States has to say to both of these countries, not just to Iran, to both of these countries, enough is enough. Enough training radical Islamists, enough spending $50 billion in promoting the most intransigent form of Islam. Islam can be a force that lives peacefully, but the form of Islam that is in Iran right now, the form of Islam that is being most actively propagated by Saudi Arabia, can only get the region in more trouble and could only become uh, uh, incendiary for sectarian war that will engulf everybody and will send millions, millions more to Europe. There are now 50 million Muslims living in Europe, a fact unprecedented in 1300 years of history. There were always, always more Jews and Christians living in the Muslim world than there were Muslims in the Christian world. There are now 50 million and counting. Increased sectarian war will increase the mass migration. And how many more uh, Hungary, how many more Le Pen's you will have in Europe after this move begins is anybody's guess. Well, thank you. And I think uh, one takeaway, too, from this discussion though, thus far, although we call it new regional orders, the word regional is a bit of a disclaimer. In each of these cases, I think you see more global impacts associated with what's going on within a region. And in the cases of some of these countries, their global reach has been, uh, in fact, all of them through cyber uh, versus just regional. So thank you for that. Uh, Michael? So you've asked a hard question. We only have 28 minutes left. I need, I need 80 minutes to answer your question. But uh, let me just say a couple and of- you can't have the whole 28. Well, I'm not planning to take it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, let me just say a couple of things. Um, first, we've got to start with us. Uh, we need to get our own house in order. We need to be, have a sense that this is a common mission, American national security and American prosperity. And if we continue to fight over ourselves, between ourselves, we will lose the struggle against the three countries we're talking about. I firmly believe that. And I want to remind people when, when, when if, if God forbid, there was ever a nuclear weapon from any of these three countries that would land in Palo Alto, it's not gonna discriminate between Democrats and Republicans, okay? We, this, uh, it's called American national security for a reason. And this piece just, uh, it just breaks my heart that we don't think of ourselves as a nation vis-a-vis -vis these places. We're so focused on fighting with each other. Number two, getting our own house in order. We've talked a lot about technology. You know when we peaked? in terms of spending on research and development? 1964. That was a long time ago. What was happening in 1964? Well, that's when we were united against a common enemy. And we knew we were together. I, I don't remember that. I was only one years old. Uh, but I've read about it. We thought we had a common enemy. And we embraced and we paid our taxes to invest in research and development that helped places like Stanford and, and, the, and the militaries that you guys came from to win the Cold War. We need a similar commitment to research and development, the things you were talking about in terms of our school system. If we are going to compete against China and Russia and Iran in the 21st century, we got to have a stronger game at home if we're going to compete. And we're not having that conversation right now. Nobody's talking about research and development. Well, no, that's not true. Some are. It is not the focus that it needs. Third, we have to lead. I'm sorry, but we cannot withdraw. Superpowers, as my friend Bob Kagan said, don't get to retire. Yeah. Uh, and and, and the, the, the fallacy of that argument is that if we just pull back and withdraw and let other people lead, we're going to lead from behind, right? Remember that phrase from the Obama administration? That means there'll be no leadership. 
because into that vacuum will be a vacuum. Even the Chinese, I, I, I've been spending a lot of time in China lately. I, I think it'd be, you know, this notion that they're gonna take over the world, I don't see that. I think there'll be anarchy. I think there'll be a void of leadership. And so I think whether we like it or not, if it's not us, there will not be another leader of the free world. That means respecting and doubling down on alliances, and that means respecting and doubling down on ideas of a free society. That doesn't say a free American society. Uh, these, are not, these are not American values, these are universal values. And that is the fourth thing then. Remember that there is an ideological component to it in dealing with e all three of these countries. And at this time, I think, uh, you know, in this time of retrenchment, as Abbas said, we're in a, a period of retrenchment, we gotta preserve what we have. To me, countries like Tunisia and Ukraine are vital to American national security today. And you may say, well, why do I care about Tunisia and Ukraine? I don't even know where they're at. Well, those are two countries that in very difficult neighborhoods are fighting for ideas of a free society. We should be doubling down and engaging with them so that if they succeed, our free world will be expanded and succeed. Um, and then finally, with respect to autocratic challengers, Iran, China, and Russia, uh, I do think there's some lessons from the Cold War. And I think it is a mix of containment and engagement. Uh, with respect to Russia, I think it's three quarters containment, deterrence, but one quarter engagement, as we did during the Cold War, push back when we must and engage when we can, whenever it serves America's national interest. And, and maybe it's a little bit different percentages for all three of these, these uh, countries that we have to deal with, but I think it's some mix of a grand strategy in each of those regions that you do that, and to emphasize again, you do it most successfully as we learned during the Cold War when you're not doing it alone, but you're doing it together with allies. So those would be, that's, that's where I would start. And I have many, many more, but I'll stay I'll end for now. I'm gonna be brief uh, because I think you know, to get to your questions is the most important thing. But uh, one, I would start by giving everyone a map. Um, and, and taking a look at what is going on in the world today and how does it affect us and how does, does it affect those who share our values and our ideas. And I think that's one thing. Uh, also, on, uh, to spring off Mike's point, you know, I always have a theory that you win a race in one of two ways. You either trip the other guy or you run faster. We're too focused on tripping the other guy. We're too focused on, you know, how do we put China in, the, in a penalty box? How do we keep them from moving forward? Our focus should be on how do we move forward? How do we um, regenerate the, the initiative and the innovation that was so much a part of those peak years? Um, you know, when I, this past summer, I know all of us of a certain age look back nostalgically on the landing on the moon. Um, that was not easy, but it represented a coming together of American industry, academia, and government in a way that we achieved something that hasn't happened since. And so I think that has to be rekindled. And in order to do that, uh, sorry for circling back around on education. It is so important and you know we all talk about STEM and, and I'm a firm believer that we have to educate for the new technological future. But um, an educated public also has to understand uh, where it came from. It has to understand its history, its peaks and its valleys. And it also has to have a firm understanding of this incredible, incredible experiment that a bunch of bright young folks created on this soil a couple centuries ago. So if we can do all that, we're going to be in great shape. <laughs> all right. If we can now, I'd like to shift to questions from the audience here. Mike's out here positioned strategically. Uh, don't be bashful. And remember my premise, I want gray hairs and I want young hairs. <laughs> Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very intelligent and thoughtful presentation today, and I wish I could ask the question from the young side, but I'll try to form <laughs> it from the other side. And I look back over the last 70 years and marvel at how well we did in America, how many problems we took, 
how many solutions we came up with, how concerted we were in getting together as a nation and making things happen. Now, not to make this political, if I can possibly do this, in the last 11 years, we have fragmented in a way that I don't know how we're ever going to be able to bring this country back together and be able to solve the problems of global warming and artificial intelligence and the nations that are breaking apart and all of the things that we face. What in heaven's name do we do to solve the problems of America as a totality, not as two disparate groups? Any comments? Uh so I'd say two things. First, because uh, uh, I really like what you said about history, and I think it's important to study our own history mm -hmm. and remember that we did experience different times of doubt. Uh, you know, 1949, 1950, that was not a great time for ideas of a free society. It felt like the Red Scare, China had just fallen. It felt like the Soviets and the, the Chinese were coming together. Those were some uneasy times. The 1970s, uh, again, as a historian, as somebody who teaches this, um, remember, it didn't look so good back then. Our society was uh, divided at home. Uh, again, communism was, was marching in, uh, in Asia and in Southern Africa, and, and it felt like the, the, t the correlation of forces, as the Soviets used to call it, was moving in their direction. And go back and read some of that literature. I'm actually doing that now for a book I'm writing. Uh, go back and read the literature in the mid-70s. There was a time of not very much confidence in where America was going in the world. And I, I, just I don't know the future, uh, but I do know that we do have the democratic institutions in place that allow for the possibility of renewal uh, because of those, those uh, previous uh, periods. Uh, and I do think you know, compared, who would you rather be in 30 years? Think about it this way. We have not talked about the problems of Iran, Russia, and China internally. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that. Uh, that there's a lot of drama coming in all three of these countries. Uh, China today, yeah, they're about to match us in terms of, 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 of the economy. But GDP per capita, they're, just, they're still 78th in the world. 78th. The top 20 are all liberal democracies. Uh, there's a lot of drama between a middle-income country and a high-income country. Iran, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Abbas to talk about it. Russia, uh, who would you rather be uh, in those three countries uh, over the next 30 years or America? I would much rather have our political institutions, our economic institutions, because I know we have the possibility for renewal. I'm not, I do not have that same confidence about those other three countries. Oh, and by the way, maybe having more confidence in our ideas might help us vis-a-vis uh, -vis our challenges with the three countries we're talking about. Uh, let me say a, a couple of words. I, uh, when Mike wasn't born in 64, I came to the United States as a 15-year-old uh, Iranian. At that time, in half of the restaurants in this country, someone with the color of skin of Obama could not enter. Johnson, in his memoir, says, I, I cannot believe that half of these countries, the son of my driver, can't get into a restaurant. And then the country elects Obama as a president. This is a country of remarkable resilience. This is a country that can fix a lot of problems. Look at the plight of women from where they were to where they are. There are many problems, and this is, in my view, one of the most challenging moments that this country has faced. But if there is one country that can face it, if there are one people who can face it, it is the resilience and essentially the good nature of this, these people. I'll, I'll be completely shameless. You can continue to uh, support Hoover programs um, <laughs> where you can have ideas uh, kicked around. But in, in all seriousness, I think that um, um, we should take every opportunity to reflect on, you know, as, as Mike and Abbas said, on the journey where we've been. It has not been easy. It has not been pretty. Uh, but I think that we have to reflect on that. I also believe that we have to rekindle in the United States uh, a desire and a value system for young people to engage in public service uh, and to be able to participate to bring forward solutions in ways that they then can influence future generations. Easily said, 
but I really do think that it's important that in any venue where we can talk about those who go into the arena to try to work on public policy, who uh, try to move this ball forward, uh, that they should be applauded and, uh, and acknowledged for their good work. And the last piece I will also throw in has been sort of uh, resonated here is education. Uh, a lot of times today we focus a lot and we need to on STEM education, but I would also say we have to keep world history as another principal foundation that we have to improve in our education system. Sir. You must have been reading my mind, seriously. Uh, I, I'm not completely gray, gray like that gentleman, but I got a little bit around the edges, so I'm kind of in the middle. So, but anyway, I grew up in Chicago. From a, with a blue collar family, my parents sacrificed to send us to Catholic schools. And I worked my way through high school and college and got scholarships to go to the University of Illinois. The public school education system and the Department of Education was established back in the 70s. And look at all the billions of dollars that have gone to Washington and the public education system hasn't gotten any better. It's a monopoly and that's the problem. As you know with monopolies, innovation gets stifled. The private and Catholic and parochial schools in this country are basically the incubators of education, decentralized education from Washington, put it back in control of local okay. yeah, it, local parents. My parents belong to the PTA Society at the local Catholic school in Chicago where I got my primary education and also Catholic school in the high schools. And consequently, that is how we got, I got my education. And it is one of the best I ever had, and that's what has gotten me to where I'm at today. And my point is decentralized education out of Washington, put it back in local control with the parents where it belongs, because education is a local issue, not a federal issue and abolish the Department of Education, take those dollars, put them back into the state and the communities where they belong, and you're gonna improve the educational system in this country because if you take a look at education since the Department of Education was established, it hasn't gotten any better, it's gotten worse. Okay, yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion over the need for improving education. Are there any other comments you want? Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that we have to really come to grips with is how do you value teachers? Um, how many graduates from Stanford University go to teach high school? Um, and, and until we do that, um, when you have, a, you know, a young person that wants to teach the next generation, um, that is just barely making it financially, I think that we're not going to dig ourselves out of this rut. Can I say something? Uh, if you look at the way America faced this strategic challenges, when there was a challenge, as uh, uh, Mike pointed out, there was a lot of funds available for research. There was also a lot of funds available for cultural studies, language studies, historical studies. I think Mike uh, had a scholarship to study Russian language, I think. From the U.S. government, by the way. From the U.S. government. Me and Condi Rice. Condi Rice, exactly. Uh, the Middle East has been a central challenge for the United States for the last 40 years. The amount of funds available to teach, to have classes, to teach language, to teach Persian, to teach Arabic, to teach Kurdish has diminished. The U.S. government closed its language school in the State Department for teaching Persian. They were so angry at the Iranians for taking hostages. That, the kind of a language, the kind of expertise that Mike had, that Kandi Rice had, is missing. When they brought a team from Iran to the White House 
to negotiate during the Reagan administration, there wasn't a single official of the US government that could translate. They had to bring in a businessman, an Iranian businessman to translate, who went on to make a lot of money as a middleman in the deals that we made. <laughs> we need hundreds of people studying Arabic, studying Kurdish, studying Turkish, studying Persian, studying their religion. If there are centers for the study of these programs in the American academia, they have almost all been created by the private domain. Stanford University is the prime example of them. Islamic studies and Iranian studies, both uh, created, endowed by members of the diaspora, the uh, Islamic diaspora, Pakistani diaspora, and the Iranian American diaspora. It is uh, also interesting, you know, in my travels as a naval officer, how many countries where I would find uh, my correspondent uh, individual, my peer in any other nation, would know multiple languages uh, fluently, not just uh, partially. And I thought about when I grew up in Washington, D.C. public schools, we had to learn uh, another language. French was mine, uh, going through s secondary education. But when I got to my kids going through school, my last one, it was, we parents had to fight to allow that kid to get Spanish. Uh, totally different value system. So it gets back to value system and how we infuse education uh, around what needs to be done if we're gonna be a great nation. Can I just say one quick thing? Uh, there's a lot of great expertise at Hoover on this question. I, this panel does not represent that. Uh, no, don't disrespect, uh, gentlemen. Uh, really? And I, I, there's probably a lecture series in this series on education. You already did it. So look at the video, because I think there are a lot of great ideas that have been generated here. My own parochial view, you, you where the gentlemen go, you, you talked about your going to private schools in Chicago. Uh, I, 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 I grew up in Montana, I went to a public school, and I could not have come to Stanford University without the federal government. I was a work-study kid with Pell Grant money. I was on federal government money until finally a private scholarship gave me some money to go to school. It was called the Rhodes Scholarship, and I went to Oxford. Uh, I just think it's a whole government thing. I, I, I think the idea that the private sector is going to solve it is not right, and I also think the idea that the, the, the Washington's going to solve it is not right. It needs to be a whole of society issue, especially to subsidize the things that otherwise might not happen. I want to correct the record. The government did not pay me to learn Russian. The government paid me, when I was doing my master's degree at Stanford, to learn Polish. Yes, and you, yeah, you're laughing. Why the hell would you learn Polish? Because back then, we were fighting in the Cold War, the government, not the private sector. I also want to emphasize that. We had Polish classes here, but nobody took them. I was in a class with two students, <laughs> and I was incentivized to take Polish because we had a grand strategy that we thought having some expertise on Poland might help us win the Cold War. And so I just, I just show you, I emphasize that because we're not, that's the kind of grand strategy I think Abbas was talking about. And I think it's a whole of society approach that, that includes both the private sector, local education, and also private institutions like Stanford. Sorry, sorry to go on about my personal history. Very good. I won't ask you your age, but uh, thanks for <laughs> joining us at the mic. Would you address or just touch on the impact of climate change in these regional relationships? Yeah. Question. Um, it's huge, and you know we can argue, and I think that's where um, good policy has been distracted because we are in this passionate debate about you know why. Uh, the approach that I take is th the planet is changing; it's pretty clear, um, and 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 I would argue that particularly as it applies to Russia and to China. Um, you know, the opening of the Arctic is uh, a significant uh, point of history in the planet. Uh, Navy guys get really excited when uh, new oceans appear. So for <laughs> Cecil and I, this is uh, a big deal. But, uh, you know, but that changes the dynamic and it's going to change Russia's fortunes and China is going to be up there big time. I would submit that um, the entire planet will feel the effects of uh, uh, changes in food supplies, 
when you get into the South Pacific in particular, Bangladesh, uh, South Asia, and some of Southeast Asia, there are places that will be underwater in not too long. I think the great challenge that China will face, and indeed all of Asia will face, you know, we fixate on the ice cap that's melting uh, in the Arctic. There's another northern hemisphere ice cap that's melting as quickly. The big difference is that it feeds all the great rivers of Asia, and it provides all the water for Asia. And when you put in place hydroengineering projects at a national level that's trying to preserve that resource, um, my view is that within 20 years, wars will be fought in Asia over water. Because unlike energy, which we've found alternatives for, no one has found an alternative for water. And that becomes a powerful, powerful weapon. It's also interesting how much of the population lives near water in the world at large. And uh, how much of that area will be underwater if the trend continues. Being in Karabachi one time uh, in the last uh, six, maybe eight years now, but uh, they were very concerned about being underwater. And you say, well, you know, you're looking at trends, is it real or not? But the, tr the reality was when you looked at their food source and crops were already being impacted because of seawater entrenched uh, into their land and into their soils. So it's real and it is something that we need to get at. Please. Oh, uh, um, go how ahead. How long do you think that each of these leaders will be in power for? How long will they keep power? Can you hear it? Um, and of the countries that you're talking about, how do you foresee those transitions going? And do you think that the U.S. will be eyeing those times as an opportunity uh, to be influential there? I missed the question. Uh, how long will uh, Xi, Putin, and the Supreme Leader be in power? I think that was a question. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. And I don't mean to jump. Can I jump? The jump I do mean to jump the queue. Uh, uh, because, it, it, because we're running out of time, and you bring up something I think we need to at least uh, chew on a little bit, which is the nature of these countries and their history and culture versus the nature of the regimes versus the nature of the individuals, right? Uh, now, what, what there is the shared history of empire, uh, and, and all three of these places have uh, old civilizations. Uh, right now, they're all autocracies. Uh, but in the case of Russia, I want to underscore, Russia hasn't always been ruled by autocracies. Um, and if you look over even just the last 30 years, there's been a lot of variation in the regime type, and there's been a lot of variation in the leaders. Russia under Vladimir Putin is very different than the, end, the last years of the Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev. And I think we do a real disservice to our analysis if we treat these countries as if they're always gonna be the same and they, they have these hundreds and thousands, in the case of these countries, thousands of years of history and that there, there will never be change there. I do not, with, the, with respect to Russia, I do not believe that. I think that Mr. Putin and his regime in, is, in a, is in a precarious place. I do not think, what is the more radical prediction? Putinism will be in place in 30 years, or there'll be something else. The first one is the much more radical uh, prediction. You already see, under incredibly controlled circumstances, uh, people going to the streets and protesting against the regime, uh, winning elections under when you don't even get to put your first team on the field and, and let you, you, they just won 50% of the seats in the Moscow city elections. Um, and, and the trend of modernization that I was alluding to, the richer people get, the more property they own, sometimes they then say, well, you know what? No taxation without representation. That, that old idea that you were referring to, uh, I found there's a lot of, and, and you don't have to trust my anecdotes, there's a lot of empirical data to suggest that a lot of people around the, the planet also believe in that idea. Uh, and I think the ideas in the long run are on our side, and I think we should be more confident about them. Uh, and I think there's a lot of drama coming for Putinism and autocracy in Russia, maybe not during Putin's rule, but when he leaves, he has not put in place a regime that I think will uh, li outlive him for very long. And I want to leave you with one anecdote, because we've been a little too scientific here today. Uh, it's fantastic to be 
the U.S. ambassador anywhere. If you ever get the chance, do it. Uh, I love being the U.S. ambassador in Russia uh, and representing our fantastic country there. Uh, one of my jobs was to go and meet Russians and to go to their companies. And I had a big interest in technology because of here, so I, I would spend a lot of time at tech companies there. Uh, and one day I was at a Russian tech company, and there, had, there was about 100, 200 people there. Uh, by the way, it looked just like Silicon Valley, free food, bean bags, 80% male. Uh, um, and we were talking about technology, and then it kind of veered towards politics. And I asked everybody, there had been a big demonstration in May 2012. I asked the room, how many of you participated in that demonstration? Almost every hand in the room went up. And about 10 minutes later, uh, there was another demonstration coming up. And I asked, well, how many plan to go to that? Only three hands went up. That's because in the first demonstration I was just talking about, the regime cracked down and arrested people. And some of those people, by the way, are still in jail today. And then the conversation moved on to HI and machine learning or something like that, HA, uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning. And at the end, and it reminded me because a woman closer to your age than mine, sitting in the back, she raised her hand again and she said, Mr. Ambassador, I think you misread the room when three hands went up. I didn't raise my hand, she said. I'm an engineer. I have two kids. This is all in Russian. She said something to the effect of, you know, my no good for nothing husband, he can't take care of my two kids if I'm in jail. I have to work for a living. I can't afford to be arrested at the next demonstration. But don't think for a minute that I've changed my mind about this regime. And I think that's really important to remember when you hear about how popular Putin is or how unpopular other autocratic leaders are, that, 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 that she has ideas about a free society and she hasn't changed her mind uh, uh, despite the fact that she can't get arrested today. And I always remember that interaction about the long term. In the long term, I am radically optimistic about Russia and U.S.-Russian relations because I think in the long term, ideas of a free society are really powerful and they're going to win uh, in the long term. Well, we have uh, unfortunately run out of time with my guide back there. Uh, but I want us to first off, let's give a round of applause, particularly to that young lady that came up to ask that thoughtful question. <laughs> it can sometimes be intimidating giving all the gray hair folks like ourselves uh, to do that. So keep that questioning spirit. Uh, let's give another round of applause, though, uh, to this astute panel and all the great work they do. And the discussion and conversation doesn't have to stop uh, in that I we're going to conclude here, but I wanted to invite you all into the outer area here for refreshments and continued conversation. Thank you all for coming.